next thing that came up was I needed a job. And the job market was, we all complained about it already in 1968, 1969, but it was, um, People would get a job, they just wouldn't get a job at the place they might have thought would be eager to hire them. The sort of period in which the large, um, large departments exchanged their students were gone already. Um, but most of us ended up with, with reasonable positions. I was in a, in some ways, rather awkward position because my dissertation had been in history of anthropology. For my master's thesis, I had done a, a biography, an intellectual biography of Daniel Garrison Brinton. I chose that topic because there were some original documents in Philadelphia, and I had begun doing field work, doing archival work at the American Philosophical Society um, in about 67 or 68. Well, no, 66, 67 it would have been. Um, because of that project, and I figured it could make a, a serious contribution as opposed to just a glorified book report. And Dell's comment on that piece was, you could have gotten a PhD for this at a second-rate university. It took me a few days to realize he was bragging about it rather than insulting me that it was a second-rate piece of work, um, however. I didn't publish that until 1988 as a revised piece, but I did write some things about Brinton and used him as a foil for the professionalization of American anthropology, which had been the dissertation topic. Um, I was, however, in a position of being an anthropologist without field work in a conventional sense. I agreed with George Stocking's position that archival work is field work in, in a different kind of way, and I still take that position. But it was a hard one for job hunting. Um, Dell did get me some interviews at places that were clearly not interested in, in hiring me. At Columbia, Harvey Pitkin was the linguist, and he and I had already clashed on a couple of things. He was a very old-fashioned descriptive linguist type. Um, so I knew this was going to be a free weekend in New York, but I met Bob Murphy, which turned out to be one of life's pleasures. I think that's also where I met um, Abe Rossman and, and um, Paula um, Rubel, who became good friends. So there, there were a number of, of incidental things that turned out to be fun. I was applying for... Um, and seemed to be being taken halfway seriously for a job at a, a major southern institution. And when I called them to say I had an offer at the University of Alberta, the southern accent of, of the phone operator, who also wasn't terribly clever, really got to me, and I thought maybe this is the wrong region for me. I think that prejudice came from all the, the civil rights movement types who were part of the pacifist movement in Philadelphia, the anti-Vietnam thing, and I have largely gotten over it since. But I think I was probably wise at that point to figure that that wasn't a good direction for me to move. The job I ended up taking, and I wanted to be somewhere where I could do field work as well as teach, um, I liked the idea of working where you live, and I have, have always done that. So the University of Alberta seemed like a, a really good plan. Um, I did have to ask them what kind of Indians they had there. Turned out they were Cree. And again, that's the never looked back kind of thing. I also had to look up where Edmonton was on the map. I really was a, a New England type by that point and, and had very little sense. But I wanted to be somewhere where I could do field work and where I would be far enough away from, from the Philadelphia intellectual world to be myself and not just part of a network, which I've certainly maintained. But it seemed, and I think it was the c correct decision. I had thought at that point that I would go to Edmonton for a couple of years, do some field work in my spare time around the teaching, and then come back to New England.
it didn't work out that way because there were so many things that, that happened. Um, I had also thought that I would perhaps like to continue the work that I'd been doing with the Iroquois um, through field work, but because of the location I chose to take the job, uh, that was not possible. At Penn, I had, through a friend, learned about a course in Iroquois ethnography specifically taught at Temple University in Philadelphia by Betty Tooker, who was a field worker par excellence, despite her ethno-historic archival reputation. So Betty took me to the Iroquois conferences, I think twice during my um, graduate career, and I had met a lot of the people who did Iroquoian scholarship. Um, Tony Wallace in those days did not go to the Iroquois conference, although in his later years he did again. Um, so I did try to keep, I really lost track of Iroquoian work entirely till I moved back to Ontario in 1990. So when I got to Edmonton, okay, um, teaching, my only question in the, the interview, which was by phone, um, was what time would be the earliest class you would want me to teach? It was a long pause. The then chair of the department said cautiously, could you manage 11? And I said, yeah, I think so. Okay. But anything much earlier than that would have been torture. I am still, and certainly was then, a night owl. OK, so the first thing I did when I got settled was to try to find some people to begin learning the Cree language. And through one of, those, through one of their grad students who had been in that class at Temple, that I had wandered into through another whole set of other connections, uh, I managed to um, to get myself introduced to some um, elderly people in a community that was easily commutable to, um, so that I could spend weekends there. I was, I'd managed to get a Tuesday-Thursday teaching schedule, so that left me quite a lot of time to play fieldworking anthropologist. Um, it certainly wasn't long stretches at a time, but it was so repetitive. There's something to be said for, okay, she left, we'll never see her again, and next weekend, oh, she's back. Mm -hmm. Um, so there, there came to be a real flow to that. Um, the old people that I stayed with, um, mostly I think I was their chauffeur service, and I spent most of the small grants that I usually managed to get locally um, on beer and gas. Um, I don't like beer, so it wasn't me, believe me. But anyway, the... And the chauffeur service was something really important. The woman was, was Mary Rose Cardinal, was 61 when I met her. She insisted that I call her older sister um, rather than mother. I was 25 at the time, well, turning 26 when I took that job. Um, so she insisted that we would, in some sense, be sisters. She wanted me to call her husband Nipapa, my father, however, because that was more of a protective role that that would put him into. So I learned initially very quickly about how kinship relationships do and don't get extended. They're certainly one-on-one -on -one decisions. You don't acquire the same relationships to everybody at the same time. Um, she had gone to school um, was the, um, her older sister who lived across the road and was three years older um, had not gone to school and, and spoke practically no English still, they both being in their 60s then. Um, her husband, Clovis Cardinal, was, um, was technically Métis, did not speak English, and was still trapping at that point. So we lived off his trap line, largely, except when I went down to the Moosehorn Market and bought a chicken that we would come home and roast. And I sometimes brought 
various things with me also, and I certainly bought groceries as well as beer. And Mary Rose always thought she had a really good deal. She said, hey, I want to go visit my friend so-and-so. Where does so-and-so live? Oh, it's just down the road, so 90 miles down the winter road. You sort of, oh, okay. But I got to meet a lot of elders that way um, and just sort of sat in the background. So I acquired through my relationships with them um, the kind of understanding of Cree where you follow the conversation, initially picking up just keywords and kind of what is going on, because Cree was almost always the language spoken around the kitchen table. And and then began to learn bits of, of conversational stuff. And I knew a little bit about the grammar of the language already. So that was OK. Um, it was, now, technically, they weren't Indians. Mary Rose was, was a treaty Indian from the Big Stone Band at Wabasca de Marais. Um, but she was married to Clofus, who was technically a Métis, which is an accident of, of various where they were living, because he was certainly, in some ways, more traditional than Mary. So it was an odd kind of, uh, it was an odd kind of community. There was a bit of reserve land, but a lot of it was not. Um, Clovis ran a trap line, which was at the junction, basically at the junction of, of the Athabasca River, um, about 20 miles out of town. Um, and he did take me out to see his trap line once. I learned to stay out of the way when people were doing practical things in part. I was handed a scraper and told to work on a hide a few times, and after I punched holes in a couple of them, we gave up on that one. I turned out not to be terribly good at beadwork or quill work either. Um, I think of myself as having the manual dexterity of a chimpanzee. Um, that is not particularly good. Um, but I did learn a lot about how to do things. I learned a lot about some kinds of cooking, um, certainly from Mary Rose, and something about dealing with, with um, the stuff that came home to be dressed and, and make its way to the table, ultimately. It was a difficult community with a great deal of of um, disruption basically caused by alcohol, not yet drugs. Um, I found that my most effective field work happened before early afternoon, and things sometimes got a little dicey after that. Um, it just seemed normal. But I remember at, a, at an anthropology meeting, or it was then the Canadian Association of Sociology and Anthropology, talking to a senior sociologist who was, who held a significant government position, whom I would not want to name at this point. And she said, oh, calling Lake Alberta, you don't, there's nothing to study there. They're a disorganized community. People live there. It's their home place. I know how clearly that land is the home place for those people. And I have, al I have always taken offense with that kind of position. A few years later, I was hired to do a, an evaluation of a snowshoe, traditional snowshoe-making operation in the community. It was a disaster financially. But I was talking to one of those people that this sociologist would have said was completely hopeless and, and practically subhuman. And he was so proud. You know, that's ours. That's the way we did that. That's okay. Now, he was a miserable creature in, in many ways. He was continually lecturing me on how if I didn't want to, to sleep with him, I must be prejudiced against Indians. He was not the only person who took that line, but he was certainly one of them. And I used to sleep in Mary Rose's cabin with a baseball bat. And there was one point where she bashed him with a, with some firewood, and he fell out her front door into the mud. Um, he could be a tad difficult, but that doesn't mean 
that he's not worth taking seriously for the things that give what structure his life has to it. Um, I just really found that difficult. Anyway, I went on sort of hanging out, being around, doing what was whatever was going on, and not having the pressure of having to stick to a topic to write a dissertation based on this fieldwork. So I worked on a number of, of issues about children and language acquisition and such. Did my first formal effort was to work with the kindergarten class because Mary Rose's sister, who lived across the uh, road, was Lane, perhaps is better, um, was raising her granddaughter, who was in the kindergarten class. And that became an understanding of the miscommunication between the school system and the teacher. The teacher liked kids. She didn't like Indians. And nobody ever stayed in that position for very long, so it didn't. Um, most of the kids came into class speaking only Cree at that point, and a couple of them sort of bilingual. So most of them repeated kindergarten and or grade one. Um, and some of that, I think, could have been avoided with a somewhat different understanding. That's when I began to think about the fact that Cree and English are not um, separated, discrete language categories. The English was the English of people whose first language was Cree, and it really was a very different English than, than the one that a city school would be teaching or that most of the people in the classroom would be trying to get the kids to speak. The Cree would be the conversational, everyday kind of Cree that the children were growing up using. But the Cree also talk in English about high Cree, by which they mean the way in which an elder speaks and people have to go home and think about it and think about what it meant and figure out how they're going to respond to that and, and what the lesson underlying it is. Um, and sometimes, and then I learned, of course, I never did interviews. I, I had the feeling that what you do is, is kind of um, ask a question in, in that kind of stare into space, not looking directly in someone's eyes, because that's rude, and say, I've always wondered about whatever. Everyone nods sagely and says, eh, hey, you've always wondered about the week to go, when to go, for example. And isn't that interesting? You've always wondered about it. Next topic, five years later. You were wondering about the week to go. And let me tell you a story. Okay, or they just launch into the story. But there's a kind of timing of, of what I had been taught to think of as speech events, which is not bounded until the consequences of the speech event have completed, and that's a very different kind of, of engagement. It takes a long time to do good field work, in a, certainly in this community, and I think in any one, uh, because things don't come together. The things that I wrote about for two kinds of Cree and two kinds of English in the kindergarten classroom and calling, like, that's still a pretty good paper. What I was talking about is still true. Um, it's just not as interesting as the kinds of things that people would be willing to share with me now. And that's gone way beyond the sorts of things that might belong in an introductory language course. Okay. Meanwhile, back at the university, I discovered that the university spoke that the university taught Ukrainian, where they told all the Ukrainian kids, there being a huge Ukrainian population in Alberta, they told all the Ukrainian kids that they didn't speak proper Ukrainian. That went over well. But it was a Slavic languages department that wanted standard language kind of approaches. In any case, they taught Ukrainian quite seriously. But they didn't teach any indigenous language in 1969. So by the fall of 1970, I had managed to persuade the advanced education folks that, and they said, well, we can't. We don't have anyone with a PhD who could teach it. So I said, okay, I'll teach it. Um, you put me on the books as the instructor of record, and you will pay a ridiculously small, but nonetheless a sum, to one or more native speakers who will work with the class. So we did that for two years in advanced education, 
Um, initially, it was with a couple of credit students for a reading course with me in anthropology. And then we were able to move it over to the anthropology department where I got teaching credit for it. It was a full year course where I got teaching credit for it every second year, which was fair enough because I was the only linguist in the department and we had a program from required undergraduate semester course all the way through to graduate students. So there had to be some kind of, of understanding about what I was going to teach. I never did teach introductory anthropology at the first year level because I couldn't. I also never taught history of anthropology because the oldest member of the department wanted to teach that course, and he got it. I, who had published in it, didn't. Okay. They let me teach it the last year I was there. Okay. Anyway, so we had the Cree course. It, we called it Cree Language and Culture, and I worked with native speakers, organizing it by semantic domains rather than grammatically and uh, progress through um, things you would never need to say again anyway. Um, so we would talk um, about some issue like kinship or food or hunting, um, animals, traditional stories, and be able to introduce vocabulary and, and concepts and, and then occasionally, well I, then I would do the grammatical material that was necessary to make sense out of that. So I also have a pretty fair understanding of, of Cree grammar in the abstract sense. I have never, however, gotten that together with my ability to follow conversation. And of course, I haven't used my Cree for almost 30 years now, so it's I couldn't do that anymore. But I've never counted myself a speaker of any indigenous language. I consider myself monolingual. There are several languages where I can run into another monolingual person and bumble along. But as my resume reads, the following languages with rapidly decreasing fluency. And that really is true. I think that to know a language or to claim fluency in it is, is a very serious level of, of expressive ability and, and communicative competence that I have never fully had in anything other than English. Um, so we needed those native speakers. And for, the most, for most of that time, um, or the most frequent person I worked with was um, a lady named Frances Thompson, who became my family's grandmother, as I had four children during the 1970s. And when I couldn't watch them, Grandma did. When I went away to a conference, um, Grandma came and stayed with the kids. And she did count my four and her eight as all being her grandchildren. I learned a great deal. Now, am I doing field work when I'm having tea with Grandma when I pick up the little monsters? Yes and no. Is field work something separate from life? No. When you do the kind where you live, where you work, it, it really isn't that simple, nor would one want it to be. And of course, people came down from various communities where I worked and, and camped in my spare room or, or on the couch, and it, there was always a kind of flow between that, between that part of my work and whatever. The Cree language course, I did that for 15 years with native speakers. And in 1985, the university opened a school of native studies. The first course they listed in their offerings was Cree, and which they intended and eventually developed to three consecutive years of Cree, um, that that would be taught by a woman who had been the uh, or sorry, that, that it would be taught by the son of a woman who had been one of my Cree language teachers at Saddle Lake, Alberta, many years earlier. So there were a lot of things that came back around. Um, and I think that I had always intended to put myself out of that job of teaching the language and never claimed to be the person who taught it or spoke it. And I think that's exactly the kind of program that, that one needs to see grow. And it did. Now, in my own teaching, we'd run into, Grandma didn't know how to say something, or there was discussion about how to say it. 
and the Cree students in the class would run home to ask their grannies. And then the next class, we'd hear what everybody's granny said. And they came from all different parts of Alberta. So their grannies disagreed about how to create a word for ashtray, for example. And ashtray is not ash plus tray, although you can do that, but that's not Cree. The Cree requires you to say something about the force that's moving from here to there. It says nothing about the ash, just the direction of movement through the force of gravity um, and so on. So we talked about those kinds of things and about grammatical categories. I spent a lot of time thinking about the category of animacy and about the third person um, and the fourth, so-called fourth person and various ways of expressing things. And then I began to wonder if I was becoming too Cree in generalizing to an idea of all Native North Americans think about language use or about language this way. So I took up Slavey for two years, which is an Athabascan language of the Mackenzie Delta. And my colleague Michael Ash was doing a lot of that. So we managed to offer a course one year in Slavey uh, with a woman named Sarah Cleary, who was quite remarkable. And I really enjoyed that. But she didn't come back after Christmas, and I kept trying to tell them she wasn't going to over in Native Studies, and they kept saying, oh, no, 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 she said she was coming back. No, she wasn't. She was just being polite. Anyway, so it all got very strange. So I ended up teaching the students who were registered for a full-year course using a semantics domain approach to a Navajo dictionary and talking about Athabascan categories. We had to do something, and somebody had to finish the course because it was on the books. The next year they tried to hire, and I was going to audit, a retired bureaucrat who spoke Slavey fluently, but his gestures were wrong. He didn't think about things in a Cree way. It was awful, so I dropped that. And then I took the job in Alberta, so, or sorry, the job at Western and left Alberta. So that kind of went down the drain, but it was a really useful way of beginning to think my way through how those things worked. And was the logic behind a conference that Keith Basso and I dreamed up to talk about native interaction patterns overall rather than about the places where each of us had done field work. And so that became a book that I edited with Michael Foster, Native North American Interaction Patterns, which didn't come out till 1988, but it was, um, the conference was in 82, um, for a variety of reasons about the publication program at the National Museum, to put it mildly. However, that was a kind of bringing together and realizing that we could finish each other's stories and each other's sentences, as Keith Basso and I had been doing with one another for a long time. And again, that, that brought the kind of sense together of the fact that we were looking at broad-scale patterns that had very local, detailed um, manifestations, I guess. <laughs>